I think we're live. Okay. We're on YouTube. Very. Oh yeah, yeah. Now I see it. I see so a little. Light. Everyone should mute their um, YouTube screen if they're watching it, kind of um, at the same time. Yes. <clears throat> it's up there. Great. Jesse, can you see it on the YouTube? Can you see the chat window? There we go. Taylor Dell is watching. We've got. All right. Shall we begin? Everyone ready? Five minutes. OK, well, for all of our internet fans out there, welcome to the April. Uh, meeting of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. We're doing this through Zoom, uh, live YouTube. And um, my name is Ben Kinsley, and I'm the president this year of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. See, we've got fancy new name tags this year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so normally, uh, we meet, um, normally we meet at the, um, Bear Creek Nature Center uh, on the around the fourth Wednesday of every month. Uh, we are going to be doing Zoom this month. We're going to play it by ear to figure out the next couple meetings. We're not quite sure yet, as you know, everything's uncertain right now. Um, but today, what we usually do at the first meeting is um, introduce the officers, which I'm going to do now, and then um, talk a little bit about the club and safety in the woods what to bring on a foray when we can start doing forays again, which hopefully will be soon. And then I will end uh, the meeting with a kind of a PowerPoint presentation of images of mushrooms to get everyone excited about mushrooms, introducing uh, the kingdom of fungi and some of the Colorado mushrooms and other mushrooms that are exciting to me from, you know, I um, moved from the East Coast to Colorado a couple years ago. So a lot of my mushroom, uh, the mushrooms I'll show are from both coasts and in between, but we'll do that at the end. Um, so I've muted everybody, but I want to introduce people in in uh, one by one here. So uh, Jennifer Bell, I'm going to unmute unmute you, and I'm going to go to speaker view really quickly. Let's see, how do I pin Jennifer? Jennifer, are you there? Can you hear us? I am here. All right. So Jennifer Bell is our vice president. Uh, Jennifer was also secretary for the past couple of years. And um, so welcome. Thanks for being here, Jennifer. Anything you want to say to the club before we get, we'll come back to you in a bit, but. Dante, everybody. Awesome. Uh, and then next I'll introduce Alyssa Hartson. Um, unmuting Alyssa and pinning. So go. Hello, everybody. Great. Sorry, your video disappeared on me. Oh, that's right. I, gotcha. I can see me. I gotcha. Uh, Alyssa <laughs> is our new this year secretary and also webmaster. Thanks, Alyssa, for joining the club. And uh, thank you for having me. Responsibility. Um, anything <laughs> you want to say about either of those positions? Um, the positions, not so much. Just want to point out the website. If you haven't visited our website recently or ever, um, now is a great time to check it out. We've got some new content up. Um, there's all kinds of good information. That you can find on there including resources um, information about forays past events if you're a member you have access to the newsletter section um, which has newsletters that date clear back to the first one in 1978 um, so that's a long time ago lots and lots of newsletters so i'm sure that there's some interesting content in there um, there's also some interesting blog posts that have been posted over the winter and um, our contact information and also our join information. If you have not become um, a member and you would like to become a member, you can do that on our website where Ben is pointing out right now. And um, I think that 
Beth, our treasurer, our wonderful treasurer, will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I'll stop this, go back to, cool. Thanks, Alyssa, great. Thank you. And then Brian, I'm gonna introduce you. Where is your unmute button here? Um, yeah. Hello, can you, Brian. Can you Brian Barzi. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, what a great year we have ahead of us. If we can just make it through the next month and everybody gets healthy again. Uh, there's great snowpack up in the high country. It's really going to be exciting. We could have big rain this year. They're talking about for future uh, stuff coming. And what an exciting year this will be because how great is our board this year? They're just doing a great job for the club and all the club members are really going to have a treat this year with so many great projects we have set up. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Brian's been past president and uh, you want to talk, your mom's founded the club in what year? 1975. Awesome. So we're a pretty well-established club. We're getting better every year and we attract some of the best uh, uh, talent and the top of the science of mycology all want to come and hang out with the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. So I always would love to invite and make sure everybody understands it's a uh, open to public invitation club. Totally. And our meetings are always um, open to the public and that's why we're doing this one over YouTube live. All right, thanks, Bri. And then uh, let's see, how do I, I'll introduce Jesse first and then Mercedes, Jessica. Um, pin video here. Jessica Langley is our newsletter, one of our newsletter editors this year. Hey, Jesse. Hi. Do you want to talk a little bit about anything about the newsletter? Yeah, um, for the, all the new members, um, the newsletter is available via password on the website. So if you haven't um, joined yet, make sure that you um, check your email from Alyssa um, that should have the new password in it so you can access the newsletter. Um, contained in the newsletter this year is a you know an introduction by Ben, um, a great um, uh, write-up by Mercedes uh, Whitman about Soma Camp this year, an amazing art, uh, recipe from um, Chef Zach, and uh, if you are interested in contributing, um, we're always interested to know what you guys are doing, um, mushroom experimentation wise or other things. So um, please submit to the newsletter. Um, we're you know very curious to know what all of our members are up to, so. Great, thanks, Jesse. And then where's Mercedes? Mercedes, Mercedes Whitman, another, um, newsletter editor thanks for helping with that it's a big job yeah of course happy to be here um as jesse mentioned yeah i did a little write-up on the sonoma county mycological association or soma um their 2020 annual camp um out in occidental california where they have workshops um presentations, food demos, and forays. Um, and it's a really sweet little gathering at a CYO camp and a lot of people stay there um, and eat meals on site. Uh, and Jennifer was also there, <laughs> as was Brian. Um, and it was in January, so I had a great time being out there and being able to forage when back home it was you know cold and um mushrooms are very much not really out for the most part so yeah it was really beautiful and i met a lot of cool people awesome and so yeah that's in the new newsletter and as, as we mentioned it's on our newsletters page and also an email went out to current members um, awesome thanks mercedes and Last but not least, let's find Isabel. There we go. Hello, Isabel. This is Isabel Gring, who is our librarian. Hello. Uh, I would like to show you the library really quick. So it's all in this chest. 
this. Tons of questions. We've got cookbooks and identification books on, on mushrooms and fungi. And if you remember and you would like to check out a book, just contact me through my PPMS email and or talk to me in person when we're able to do that. And I'll bring you the book when I can. I think there's a list. Yeah, there's a list on the website of all the books. So you know which ones you'd like to borrow, when, and I can get them to you. Awesome, I'll do a screen share real quick and we can show people where that exists on the website here. Um, Isabel put together a nice list. Um, it's under our resources page. Uh, we do have a lot of recommended identification books and other uh, other books. Um, people always ask about this. this is, these are some good ones here. Um, and then other websites and online resources. And at the bottom of this page, there's the lending library uh, link. Uh, Isabel's email is library at ikespeakmike.org. And then you can look at this document that you put together with all of the books in our collection. And you can check those out um, through, usually during you you bring them, Isabel would bring them to one of the meetings and you'd have it for what? Did we decide a month or something like that, Isabel? Uh, How long? A month is good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. It, it, we don't, uh, people don't often know about the library and we don't um, get a lot of people checking books out, but pay attention to that. It's a pretty great resource and, and Isabel gets to have all the books until, unless someone checks anything out. <laughs> Which is really yeah. Cool. cool. All right, thanks, Isabel. Great. Anything else, anybody? Um, Beth? Beth, did I forget Beth? Beth? Yeah, she's our treasurer. How did I forget Beth? I'm the job sorry. no one else can do. It's so I'm well. That's very important. Yes, it did a good job. Sorry. I did okay, but Beth was better. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. Here we go. Sorry, Beth. Here is Beth Leak, our treasurer. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Sure. So, our 2020 PPMS policy has changed a little bit this year. Uh, the biggest thing is children under 18 are now going to be free when they're in a family membership and they're living in the same household. New members are gonna pay $30 a year and a one-year membership will be $40 a year. And then for renewing members, one year will be $25 and one year member or one year family membership will be $35. And lifetime memberships, we love to have lifetime memberships, will be individuals will be 30 or $300 a year and family memberships will be $400 a year. So if you want to pay um, by PayPal, you can go to our pikespeakmike.org website. On the far right, you'll see a join button and you can click on that. Or you can also um, mail your membership if you wanna do it by check. And same thing if you email us at treasurer.pikespeakmike.org, um, uh, then We'll, we'll take care of it that too. Um, I also do wanna say that we really need those membership applications mailed in or either emailed to me when you join and the liability form. That's really important when we go on forays. Uh, we, we, need your, we need your signature to say you're okay with us taking you into the woods. And those are on the website here. I have a screen share going, but you can click these links. Uh, one goes to the membership application that you can fill out and the other, if you're a new member and then the um, liability waiver we need to have filled out as well. And the address to send checks are on with those forms as well. And the address for the website, because I don't think we said that is pikespeakmike.org. Pikespeakmyc.org, yeah. All right, awesome. Um, thanks, Beth. Anything? Is that it? That was good. Concise. Good. All right. Thanks. Awesome. So that's the board and all the officers this year. Um, this is all volunteer. And so we're always looking for more um, volunteers in any way. So if you're interested in being a volunteer, helping out in any anything, let us know. Um, 
Yeah. Also, oh, I forgot to mention on, on YouTube, if you want to ask questions or participate in any way, there is a chat window and you can leave comments or ask questions there. Uh, Jesse's gonna be monitoring that. Um, and so when Jennifer talks a little bit here, if you have questions, chat those and Jesse can um, read those out to Jennifer. And then when I'm doing my presentation, we can do the same thing. Cool. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, if you don't have anything else that we, if there's anything we forgot, let's talk about it now. If not, I think we can uh, move on to Jennifer's presentation. Cool. Thank you guys. You guys can stay on or leave up to you. <laughs> we'll be here for a little while longer. Cool. Jennifer, I'm going to introduce Jennifer. Let's see, unmute Jennifer. Why can't I unmute Jennifer? Who did it? There we go. Okay. All right, Jennifer. Jennifer Bell, um, thank you for uh, giving a presentation today. You did this last year, it was very popular. So back by popular demand is Jennifer Bell. Oh. Um, Jennifer has been a member of PPMS for uh, five years. Um, you've edited and written for the newsletter. Uh, you, you're one of our Facebook page administrators and you've served as our secretary uh, before this year. Um, and you say that you love being vice president because the job involves less time on the computer keyboard and more time to grow mushrooms, hunt mushrooms and make things with mushrooms. So awesome, uh, enjoy the vice presidency uh, and all the perks. Um, and a little observation goes a long way in the fungal world and that's totally true. Um, you're interested in what to bring on a foray and safety in the woods because the forest is where you spend a lot of your time. And you are a ski patrol member at Red Lodge in Montana, uh, where you became certified as an outdoor emergency care EMT. So um, it's great to have you part of our club and on, you're on almost all of the forays. Um, so let us, so you're gonna lead us through a little bit about what to bring on a foray and um, things to think about in terms of safety in the woods or the mountains, right? Um, when I first was a part of this club and the first time I was going to the mountains, you don't realize how easy it is to get turned around. And uh, it's surprising. You're not totally in a dense forest, but you can kind of lose your way pretty quickly. So um, it's good to talk about this at the beginning of every season and refresh people's memories. So Jennifer, take it away. Thank you. We will talk about both of those topics um, and we're so excited this year more than ever before about getting into the woods. We've just been inside and wearing nothing but jammies. So we all wore our special red lipstick and pants. We wore pants for this presentation tonight. We're all very excited to be here. I'm gonna talk about two things, safety in the woods and what to bring on a foray because those two things are closely related to each other. So let's talk about the fun part, which is what to wear. Don't wear cotton. If you can possibly avoid cotton, I know it smells nice when you take it out of the dryer, but cotton, think of its very nature. You go out and you're running through the hills and you get sweaty, you're gonna get sweaty, and the cotton gets wet and it holds that moisture against your skin. And we're in the mountains a lot of the time. I mean, I'm broadcasting to you today or whatever it's called, zooming to you today from 6,500 feet. A lot of times we go up to 12 and the weather can change like that. So when the weather changes like that and the winds come up, it blows that wet cotton against your skin. Hypothermia is an easy way to commit suicide in the mountains. All right, if you're wet and the wind comes up, you get tired real quick and it can kill you. It can get you sick fast. Now I'm not saying that it's dangerous to be in the mountains. It's dangerous to be in the mountains and not be prepared. So look at what the professionals wear. Okay, people like um, ski instructors, people like trail runners, even the golfers. I mean, they're wearing um, man-made fabrics. A lot of times these man-made fabrics are made from recycled materials, so they're green. And what they do is they wick the moisture away, so you're safe. As far as colors go, it was Ben who said a couple of years ago on a Morel four-way, black jeans suck. 
for mushroom hunting. And it's true, they're great if you're a guitarist on stage with a band, but in the woods, the sun will kill you with black clothes. And once again, the jeans are cotton. So they're bad to wear in the woods. So you wanna wear hiking pants if possible, because once again, they're wick away fabrics. They have pockets in all the right places. Getting back quickly to color, try to avoid the REI colors, okay? You know the kind I'm talking about, the stuff that looks like pine birch or faded greens, things like that. What you wanna do to be kind to your friends, I'm talking to you, Pat Gaffney, because she's always looking for me. And if she can't see me in the woods, she freaks out. Jessica's always looking for Ben. So we want to care about the people that we're with so we can go with them more and more. And uh, so what you want to do is wear on the top part, bright colors that don't look natural. So hot pinks, uh, royal blues, pure white, stuff like that. So that's what you're gonna wear, uh, things like that. Is it a good idea to wear shorts on a foray? It's hot, you're going out to have fun with your friends. Don't wear shorts, bad idea. And the first time you see a snake in the woods, I don't really have to say anything more, do I? Don't wear shorts in the woods. How to avoid a lightning strike. There is one surefire way to avoid a lightning strike in the woods. And I'll tell you exactly what that is. You have to pick the right time to go. Okay, you're in the woods and you gotta be comfortable and you gotta not be scared and you gotta be safe. The lightning strike is gonna happen at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is why we try to leave. I know a lot of people cuss us sometimes because we try to get together at eight o'clock and go from there because at three o'clock is when the meteorological events are gonna happen in the mountains of Colorado. So just keep that in mind and you will be safe from lightning strikes. The third thing about safety in the woods is don't get lost. And if you're new to this whole hunting for mushrooms thing, you're thinking, I would never get lost. Only stupid people get lost in the woods. Come on, it's really easy, as Ben said earlier, to get lost in the woods. And here's why. You're out there, you're in a place you've never been. You look over in that direction and there's something that looks like a weight. So you go running off and you wanna stay out of the way of the other people. You know, you don't wanna infringe in their mushroom space. And well, you get over there and there's no bullet. But you look over there and there's, oh my God, is that a Mazataki? And so you go rushing over there, it's not. And then you see something else interesting. And before you know it, I have been lost in the mountains. Uh, if any of you know Graham Steinrook, one of the, he was the first person in the state of Colorado to ever become a certified mushroom hunter. He's been lost in the woods. Um, Larry Evans, very famous mushroom hunter. He's been lost in the woods. So, and he was lost in the woods barefoot. That would really suck. So keep in mind that there's ways to avoid getting lost in the woods. And my suggestion is pay attention. You're gonna get distracted, but look at where you're going. I know it sounds simplistic. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I've just been there and I know what happens. You get distracted. Pay attention to where the trail is. Okay, I was just left of the trail and there's the brook. So I was in between the trail and the brook and there's that weird tree with the weird crotch to it. And there's that odd rock up there. Just pay attention the whole time to where you are at all times. Because when you get lost, it sucks for you, but it sucks much worse for the people that you're with because you've ruined their day. And here's the ironclad rule on our forays. If you get lost, whether for five minutes or five hours or five days, you buy dinner for everybody. So keep that in mind, all right? I've done it before, I've bought dinner. Anyway, um, I also wanna talk about what to bring with you on a foray. How are we doing, Ben, on time? Are we doing okay? We're doing great. I just wanted okay. to, let me uh, recommend one thing real quick. Sure. I'll 
how do I show myself here? And um, if we have questions, feel free to ask your questions um, on YouTube. Yeah. And Jessica will forward them to the speaker. So often where we go foraging with the club, we don't have cell service, but right. you use your phone, uh, Gmail or uh, Google Maps, um, you can download offline maps for certain areas. And if you know, if you remember, we know kind of where we're going a little bit ahead of time or even the morning of before we leave town, you can download an offline map of the area that we're gonna be in. Mm -hmm. And when we get there, your GPS will still work. And I've done this before. I got turned around once up, up on the wet mountains briefly, but I put a pin wherever the car is parked. And then my GPS will work. So if I get turned around, I can kind of walk a few feet in either direction. And it'll show me, it'll point me back to where I'm going. So that's a nice option to have to think about um, just to- You won't be able to call anyone. You won't be able to call anyone, but you will have GPS, a GPS signal. And if you have your download, uh, offline maps downloaded uh, and your starting location, you can find your way back really easily. I like RunKeeper. That's an app that I like to use a lot in the mountains. It works for me. And some people go totally old school and they bring a compass. Mm -hmm. So whatever works for you is the trick. You just want to be comfortable and you want to stay safe and you want to just go mushroom hunting and have a good time. Um, what to take with you on a foray. You need to be able to put your mushrooms into something. Okay, this is my favorite because it's a backpack and my hands are free. Okay, I can carry tons of mushrooms in here and I don't have to hold anything. Never use plastic, never use rubber, whatever you're going to use. I think that a lot of times when you hear about people getting sick for having eaten bad mushrooms. It wasn't that the mushrooms were bad. Well, sometimes maybe they were, but I think sometimes people stored them in inappropriate containers. What rubber and plastic do is they make the mushrooms sweat and essentially start the rotting process very, very quickly. Um, another thing that some people like to put their mushrooms in, very organized people who like to split up samples is paper bags, okay? You can buy these at Whole Foods or you can order them online. Um, going back to what you wear, traction is your friend. I wear my trail running shoes, okay? They stick to the ground, all right? Some people like to wear boots, snakes, okay? And in places when I, when I go to California where it's wet, I'll wear boots. I stay there by, I'm sure my friends that I go to the mountains with are tired of hearing me sermonize about my hiking poles. Um, some people don't like them because I think they think they're for old people, but um, what they do is they keep you upright, number one. They're a tool, you can use them to move the leaf over to see what's under the leaf on the ground without bending over. You spend a lot of your time on the ground when you're mushroom hunting. So this will help you do that. Worst case scenario, it is a weapon, but these poles, you're not gonna be on a trail in the mountains and you're gonna be on hills and ridges that are very steep. And you think going up is hard, going up is easy. Going down is where you're gonna roll an ankle. Now, I don't want you to break a femur or anything, but rolling an ankle is awful because they have really not gotten those ankle replacements down yet. Here is another basket. This is the kind that you hold in your hand. And as you can see, it's, um, it's got webbing on the side. So you can keep your different kinds of mushrooms separate from each other. Here is something super important. Okay, we try to have at least one of these on every club foray and there should be one in your car. We have had, we only had one minor injury in the last five years. I should call it minor mishap in the last five years since I've been with the club. And that was a semi sprained ankle and um, we barely needed to use this, but it was good to have. Uh, this is super important. Get this new one as a birthday present. Thank you, Georgie. Um, some people, when they go mushroom hunting, 
like to cut the mushrooms with scissors or uh, some people like to um, use their hands. There's that when you find a beautiful bolete and that sound it makes when you harvest it, it's just like this thunk, you know, it's just a beautiful sound. But this is your friend and it has, you can clip it to your pants. You can order these. I hate to recommend Amazon for everything. I bought one from Larry Evans. Um, you can measure, you can always hold this up when you take a photograph of a mushroom, you can hold this up and everyone will know what size of a sample you're photographing. So um, the brush is to do some field cleaning, okay, of your mushrooms. Um, you will need sunblock and I highly recommend sunblock that does not have an odor to it. Who wants to breathe pineapple smell in the Colorado mountains, number one. Number two, those sunblocks that smell sweet attract bugs. We don't have a lot of bugs in Colorado, but if you have something sweet on, they're gonna find you. And last but not least, you're gonna need, if you're gonna be a mushroom hunter in the state of Colorado, you're gonna need one of these books. They're both by Vera Evanson, okay? They're in and out of print. If you ever find one in a bookstore, buy it, all right? You're gonna need one and it's the best gift you can give to any of the rest of us. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, this one is also wonderful. They're both great books. It's just that this one is bigger because you're gonna be carrying this with you. I mean, it may feel dorky the first time to be walking in the woods with a book you will use the hell out of this, okay? And the other one. This one is based on location. And um, so there you go. Um, I, Jennifer, we I, have a question. A question, yay, what is it? Um, Jenny uh, Suba said, asks if the style of knife has a name. Uh, it's a mushroom knife. Um, <laughs> Here is, that's what it's called. There's just a couple of different ones. This is the one I bought from Larry Evans. Um, the ones that I've found that are really cool, see it says Fungal Jungle on it, that's his company. Um, if you can find one that isn't a bright color, I found some that were yellow um, because you're gonna lose, you're gonna probably lose one a season. Because once again, you're going to be distracted. You're going to be finding all these great mushrooms and you're going to run off to tell your friends or whatever you're doing and you're going to lose it. And it looks just like the woods. So the yellow ones are the best ones or any bright color that's not natural. And I guess that's it. Uh, any questions that anyone has at any time, you can get with me easily on Facebook, uh, via the website. If you have questions about mushrooms or mushroom hunting or the woods or anything, I'm, I'm happy to help you find the answer. Um, I'm also very, very happy to have Ben Kinsley as our new president this year. He came here several years ago and uh, he moved here from New York. He was a member of the New York Mycological Society and um, actually forayed numerous times with Dr. Gary Linkoff, got, he's a doctor, right? I think he, he is. I, I, I was? Know. Yes. I don't know. I don't know we, if he- We lost him doctor. last year. He's, he's a great um, mushroom book author and just a wonderful personality and uh, one of the elders at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. So um, Ben came out with Jessica. Ben is a professor of art at UCCS. And we have a couple more questions coming in, if I can. Oh, we do. Yeah. Okay. I okay. mean, not to interrupt Ben's no, uh, that's fine. resume, but um, <laughs> you already know it, don't you? So, um, Marion Saruzzi asks, do you recommend that the first time going out to bring someone who has been hunting before? And then Sophia Alicia asks if the ID guides are available through the lending libraries. Okay, so a couple of questions. All right, number one, the best way to learn, I mean, you should always go to the mountains and walk around and look for mushrooms and trees and, and general happiness. 
But if you want to learn about hunting for mushrooms and about mushrooms in general, the thing to do is join our club and go on club forays. You know, you're going to go on club forays and that's different than the time you spend alone in the mountains. They're both valuable things. If you can go with someone who has experience and you know they have experience, great. The thing about the club is you get people like Brian Barzee, who's he knows this area so well. His mother, he's got uh, mushrooms in his veins. And so you're not going to ever be led wrong as far as an ID. Um, so there you go. It's, I hope that answers your question. And tell me the other question again. Let me just uh, add something to that real quick. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just want to add that, yeah, I learned a lot. It's a, it's a kind of a scary world at first and in yes. a way like you're you're very uh you know unsure about a lot of things and going out a few times with a club like ours um is a really nice way to learn and the more times you do it with people that are knowledgeable you'll pick up on all that information uh through osmosis and also having guidebooks with you and and learning on your own but joining a club is the very best way to learn so if it's our club or another club in your area um that's the very best way to learn Okay, so the second question was about mushroom IDs. Um, sure. Yeah, I just have one more. So, sure, so sure. Um, modern foragers watching right now, thank you for watching. Um, Hi, and Trent. They, Hi, Kristen. They suggested using walkie talkies. Um, they said that they're a great safety device to keep you from yelling in the woods, the cheaper the better. So, just, you know, in terms of bringing friends and getting lost, that's a great recommendation. So, the other question was from Sophia Alicia, and it was if the ID guides are available through the lending library. Yes, there are some ID guides. Um, I know that something that I've done over the years is every time that Barry and I would plan a trip, before I even bought the airplane tickets, the first thing I would do is buy a book like this. I have a book like this for Hawaii. I have a book, you know, the, the Beset books from um, the Midwest and, and um, the, southeastern part of the United States. There's an ID book for most places where you're going to go. Um, Northern Europe, maybe, you know, there, you can find ID books for all kinds of places. I'm sure that the Vera books, I'm not sure, but I assume that the Vera books are in our lending library. Um, I highly suggest you get your own because if you're into this world, you're going to use it. It's worth, uh, I don't know, 20 bucks, 15 bucks or whatever that you're going to spend on it. Um, and I think both those books that you held up are available in town um, at Poor Richards or they were. Poor Richards is great. Yes, I bought, I bought one of my books there. Um, as far as ID goes, you got to keep in mind that the field of mycology is filled with more mystery than knowledge. Um, even the people who have PhDs in this field know. What is the percentage, Brian, of the mushrooms that are known to humans? 15%, maybe 20? Maybe, maybe even less than that. Okay, so someone like Brian who's an expert on mushrooms in Colorado, great. I mean, he can, he can help you out a lot. There's a lot of people in our club, members of the board, non-members of the board who know a lot. But the neat thing about mycology is that even a citizen scientist can make a mark, like that lady in Arizona who discovered a new kind of morel a year or two ago. She was just a, yeah. yes. you know what, she was a teacher or something. I don't know. She was not a PhD. So we can all make a mark in this field because there's so much that's not known. So the point that I'm trying to make is we can all work on the identification and let the question, can I eat this, not be the first question you ask, especially if you ever meet Vera. That would be bad. Okay, so are we back to Ben or do we have any more questions? So let me just, can I, can I add one little thing? If of you can course, Brian. Um, we use the term expert uh, loosely. If you only know 10% of what there is to know, who could possibly be an expert? But that was all very good about how 
the most expert in our field of science of our passion are very humble people because we know we're only looking at 10 percent and yes citizen scientists can make such a big difference in this year the citizen scientists in our group that are just people who work whether they drive a fuel truck down the highway when they're passionate about mushrooms and they find unusual thing and they take good pictures uh, we all have a chance of learning new stuff and everybody in the club teaches me new things with what they find. So it's a real joy and a lot of fun. And um, what a great board this year and what great energy tonight, right now. I know it is exciting. You know, Ben, maybe you should have worn, Ben and Josh should have worn their two year in a row prize winning costumes at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. And- um, well, they that category. They right. that <laughs> if we're really lucky, maybe yeah. he'll tell us how he ate that poisonous <laughs> mushroom, Gyromitra esculenta. Are you gonna talk about that? And live to tell the tale. I'm still alive, I'll, tell, I'll talk about that. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Sure. Um, let's see here. Thanks, Jennifer. That was really great. We had a lot of comments about how helpful that was on the, on the um, on the chat. So thanks so much. Good. Um, cool. So uh, I think uh, I'll just take it away now. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And usually um, at these meetings, we have guest speakers, and um, often the first meeting we have the president uh, give a little intro, which I'll do today. I just wanted to say that we we have some really exciting, or we had some really exciting things planned for the rest of the season. We're kind of on hold as is everything right now, but as soon as we know more, we'll let you know. And we're not sure yet about our next meeting. Our next meeting might be on Zoom like this again. It might be in person, we're not sure. Um, but we will communicate to all of our members and on our Facebook group as soon as we know more. Um, let me share my screen here. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully. Hopefully you guys can see that. Do we see a do we see a presentation here? Um, I can't tell anymore, but I'm assuming. Yeah, thumbs up, anybody? All right, cool. All right, excellent. So um I'm just gonna go through this. I don't know how long it's gonna take, hopefully not forever, but um uh I wanted to introduce mushrooms in case you're completely brand new to this and then talk about some mushrooms that are really exciting um, for all of us uh, in Colorado and things to look forward to um, in the coming months. So Okay. Try this. I make this bigger as big as I can on the face on the YouTube. I don't know if that's doing anything or not. Either way. Okay, cool. So um, I want to talk about how I got into mushrooms in the first place. Uh, Jessica, our newsletter editor, and I were living in um, New York City, and we go up to upstate to the Adirondacks every year. Um, and in the Adirondacks, there's a cabin that we go to. And in the cabin, we found a couple mushrooms that look like this. Um, these are the bottom of a polypore mushroom called an artist conch. And the artist conchs are known for, in folk art, to be able to, you would pour, if you find a young one with a white, smooth uh, pore surface on the bottom, you can etch into it and actually create artwork. Um, this one right here was in our cabin and, it, and it's from 1937. And this is another one we found in our cabin uh, from 1935. And it was a tradition up in that area. And a lot of the cabins in the area have shelves of these from years of uh, people going on hikes, writing their name and the date of the hike, where they went to, um, and having a collection of these. Um, it's also common to find these with like etching, etches of drawings of nature and cabins and things like that. Um, and so uh, we started doing this. This is a tradition we started started doing. We, we were looking for these on our hikes. Um, uh, the, the Latin name for the artist conch is Ganoderma aplanatum. And, um, and uh, at a certain point we were finding things that 
looked like artist conks, but they weren't working and we weren't really sure how to know the difference. So we started um, uh, becoming more interested in the, the mushrooms. And also, of course, as soon as you start looking for one type of mushroom, you start noticing a whole world of mushrooms that maybe have been kind of uh, in your sight, but kind of out of your mind um, before you kind of tuned into this world. So when we were in back in the city, we went on a, a, a walk with the New York Mycological Society to learn more about this. And the first walk was in Central Park with the renowned mycologist Gary Linkoff. And we got uh, addicted pretty quickly. His um, his knowledge and his um, excitement is so uh, was so uh, infectious, and he just got everyone so interested and excited about mushrooms. And it made you feel like you're discovering something new all the time. And in fact, even in Central Park in New York City, um, they just the New York Mycological Society just came out with a study, I think, about of a 10 year study that they were doing of all the mushrooms that found in Central Park. And you don't think about Central Park in the same way that you think about the mountains around Colorado, but the fungal life is is incredible there. Um, so pretty soon, um, something that started out as an, uh, kind of a question or an interest became an obsession uh, for us, for both of us. Um, but just to start at the beginning a little bit, what we call mushrooms really are the fleshy uh, spore bearing fruit body of a fungus. Um, it's the sexual reproductive organ of, of the fungus. Um, <clears throat> fungi is its own kingdom. You can see in this slide here, um, there are six kingdoms of life, uh, right? Plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, urobacteria. Um, and it, and part of what Brian was talking about in terms of um, fungi being, uh, you know, we don't know that much about uh, about the fungal world. Well, it was only around, I think it was 1969 that fungi was uh, given its own kingdom. We learned that fungi was in fact its own kingdom separate from plants and animals. Before then, fungi were considered to be plants. Um, so the study of mycology, uh, the study of mushrooms, mycology is a relatively young and underrepresented science. Uh, it's estimated there are around 5 million, about 5 million species of fungi on the planet, which outnumbers plants by at least six to one, yet only about 75,000 species have been scientifically identified. So again, there's so much more we don't know. Um, and when we talk about, like I said, the fleshy spore uh, bearing fruiting body of the fungus, what we're really talking about within the fungi kingdom are the basidiomycota and the ascomycota. We still have, uh, within fungi, we have some other small things like yeasts and molds and crusts and all these other things. Um, so when we look at, when we talk about mushrooms, often we're really talking about just this small little section of the fungal kingdom. Um, what you see here now, um, like we said, the, the mushroom itself is the fruiting body. Um, the vegetative part of the fungus lives underground and consists of a mass of branching thread-like hypha, which we call mycelium. So right here you're seeing um, um, the spore germinating, uh, the, the spores germinate, they fuse together with compatible hyphae. The hyphae turn into a mycelial mat. The, uh, underground, um, and then create a hyphal knot, a pinhead, a primordium, eventually a fruiting body. That fruiting body releases spores out of its gills or its, whichever spore releasing mechanism the fruiting body has. Those spores fly away in air currents, drop somewhere in the, and starts over that process, right? Um, you can see here in this video, uh, spores poofing out of a um, cup, fungi, fu uh, cup fungi. And then um, you can see in this, this is a video I took on my microscope of some um, spores of, I believe, a uh, Caprinus species. And then right here is, uh, we planted some mushrooms in our garden, in the mulch around our garden last year. These are um, wine caps, Stropharia mushrooms. Um, and uh, this is mycelium right here uh, of an overturned piece of mulch. Um, so hypha have to actually uh, release enzymes um, to break down their food source into substances that the fungi can easily absorb. So fungi has to eat, and therefore um, they're more closely related to the animal kingdom than the plant kingdom.
Um, so we are just talking about spore release. Um, spores have different sizes and shapes, which can be seen microscopically. And that's a, an important part of uh, identification, um, as well as different colors, which can be seen macroscopically, another really helpful identification feature. So spore color um, can often help um, us figure out what uh, mushrooms are. You can figure out at least genus, sometimes species. Um, and so spore prints are something we can do in the field or at home uh, to get us closer to an identification of a mushroom. Um, so you can see the different color here. This is a, a, a kind of purple brown spore print here. Here we have, oh, you can see white spore print around the mushroom in nature, oftentimes when they're um, older, uh, more mature, and they've released a lot of spores, you can actually see the spore color of all the spores on the on mushrooms underneath the caps, you know, so they'll release uh, spores on the mushroom beneath, beneath the caps or in the ground around the mushroom. So paying attention to spore color is really important. Um, the parts of the mushroom are also very important to know in terms of the language. Um, when describing mushrooms, we talk about uh, attributes like color and texture of the cap, the types of gills, the gill attachment, um, the presence of a ring or a veil on the stalk or a partial veil. Uh, this is the stalk itself has certain qualities. And then the bulb or the base of the stalk often uh, has a vulva or lacking a vulva. These are things that help us start to be able to identify mushrooms um, pretty quickly, at least to maybe genus, right? And then this is a really commonly used, very helpful guide by Kit Skates. It's the easy guide to mushroom descriptions. Last year, we gave some of these out uh, at the beginning of our, our first meeting. And um, you can actually find some really, you know, $5 or something from, I think, Fungi Perfecti. Paul Stamets' site sells some laminated versions of this. It's a nice guide to have in your pocket um, when you're out in the field. But as you can see, there are many attributes to consider in order to properly identify a mushroom to species, including size and shape, color, texture, odor and taste, gill type, uh, gill attachment, stems, veils. So this is a really nice kind of guide you can start with. What is the, is it a conic, uh, uh, um, cap, is it a uh, cylindrical cap, et cetera. And then you, you can kind of break this chart down and get somewhere close possibly. Um, there's a lot of features. And so part of kind of joining a club and going out and looking, having a guide, you start learning some of these things. It's kind of overwhelming all at, uh, all at the beginning, but um, over time you start kind of remembering certain things. And of course, um, habitat is incredibly important. Uh, different species grow in different habitats with different trees and in different seasons. Um, uh, species are different on the West Coast than they are on the East Coast. They're different in Colorado than they are in the Midwest. They're different across continents. Um, in Colorado, elevation is a major factor. That is something I didn't have to think about or really think about at all before moving here. Um, it, for instance, uh, in the spring, we look for blonde morels with cottonwoods in like lower elevation riparian zones. Um, as the season progresses, we move up in elevation, essentially following the season up the mountain with snowmelt and moisture. In late August, we are usually looking for porcini uh, in association with spruce at around 10,000 feet. Um, however, all of this depends on moisture. So if there's no rain, no moisture, there's no mushrooms. Brian also already talked about how good of a winter we had. Um, and right now the temperature is getting pretty close to being right. We just need a little bit more moisture. And a lot of us uh, spend a lot of time paying attention to, you know, apps that tell us our rain, uh, the, the, the rain in certain areas and the moisture and the overnight temperatures, because in Colorado, it's a, it's a pretty harsh climate. Uh, but when it when it rains, the mushrooms really pop out. And I've been incredibly impressed, and I don't know, there's probably a reason behind this, but um, the mushrooms in Colorado grow so much bigger than they do out east in places where there's so much more moisture. For some reason, the mushrooms, when they do grow here, they, they're really big. Um, so it's really exciting uh, when the conditions are right in Colorado. Um, so the way I'm gonna break up the rest of this talk, there's a lot of pictures of mushrooms. Most of these pictures are pictures I've taken, um, but I'm gonna break it into three sections or, or maybe four, but um, 
the species of fungi are divided into three categories. So I'm going to go through each category and show you some beautiful edible and medicinal mushrooms within each category. And I want to start with a really exciting uh, category called mycorrhizal fungi. And mycorrhizal fungi uh, form symbiotic relationships with plants, mostly with living trees. Um, the, the mycorrhizal, um, the hypha of the, of the um, Mycelium forms a connection with the tree roots and they actually share resources. And so um, there are people, uh, Paul Stamets calls it the uh, wood wide web. Uh, there's a lot of resources being shared and the health of a, of a forest of a, um, is, is dependent on the, the mycelium and the health of the soil. Um, so often, uh, there are trees, smaller saplings that might not be getting the nutrients they need because they don't have enough light or they're being shaded out by a larger tree and the mycelium is able to give it what it needs to be able to, to thrive. And so uh, my, mycorrhizal fungi grow in association with trees because, um, because they really have a symbiotic relationship. Um, this right here you're seeing is one of our really, really uh, most popular mushrooms in Colorado, the Boletus rubiceps. The, Colorado porcini, um, and these are mycorrhizal with Engelmann spruce. Um, here are some giant porcini, like I said, mushrooms in Colorado get really big. Here are some giant Boletus rubiceps from Telluride from last year. When we talk about boletes, boletus, uh, boletes are mushrooms that have pores instead of gills. So um, one of the identification features of mushrooms is that, that you know, what, it, what is the pore surface or the gill surface like? What is the uh, spore releasing mechanism? And so this is one automatic identification feature. We have pores like this, we're generally going to be a bolete, right? We have gills like this, it can be a number of things, but you can see right away the difference between a gilled mushroom and mushrooms with pores. Um, another feature, and this happens a lot in um, boletes, is staining. Um, um, so when mushrooms are cut or bruised, often they stain a color like blue that can happen quickly or it can happen slowly. So uh, in this case, um, well, I can't remember exactly, but um, if it stains quickly or slowly, that is one way you can start identifying a, a, a mushroom, right? Often people, uh, think that um, staining means the mushroom is psychedelic. That is not true. That is a feature of some psil psilocybe species, but it's also a feature in lots of other species of mushrooms as well. Um, so these are all, again, uh, mushrooms that are, are mycorrhizal. Um, you can see here on the left, we have a really great edible mushroom in Colorado, the Lactari Lactarius deliciosus, or the saffron milk cap. Um, those mushrooms actually, um, stain kind of a, a nice, I don't know, like blue green. Um, but when you first cut them, it's almost like red and almost like bleeds, but they're part of Lactarius, uh, the Lactarius group. And the Lactarius group is known to called Lactarius because when you cut it, it actually lactates, a milking, um, and milk comes out. That's why it's called a milk cap. So a Lactarius, if you cut the gills, uh, milk will come out. That's another uh, identifying feature. Um, mushrooms can have spines or teeth instead of gills or pores. So in this case, we have um, uh, the hedgehog right here, Hydnum repandum, um, has spines or teeth. Um, so does uh, Sarcodon imbricatus, the hawkswing. That's another common mushroom in Colorado. Um, it's called hawkswing because the top of the mushroom looks kind of like feathers, but the bottom has spines or teeth. That's just another way that spores are released. So again, right away, there's a, those are various things. If you've never looked at mushrooms before closely like this, it's like, wow, those are already some uh, factors that you can use to start identifying fairly quickly. Um, chanterelles and black trumpets are mushrooms that are uh, delicious edibles, also mycorrhizal. Um, chanterelles don't have true gills. They have more like ridges. Um, so um, that's something to be aware of. And then with a black trumpets, uh, they're kind of wrinkled or maybe really smooth. They don't have really gills at all. Um, and so uh, chanterelles and black trumpets, hopefully it's a good year out here. I haven't seen them in Colorado very much since I moved here, but I think uh, Brian was saying that this is gonna be a good year. 
Um, so we're hoping to find good chanterelles this year. Okay, that's just a couple examples of mushrooms um, that are mycorrhizal. There are many, many more, obviously, uh, but I don't want this, this talk could probably last uh, for days and days and days. So <laughs> I'll just give you a little teaser. Um, the next group of fungi I wanna talk uh, about are the decomposers, saprophytic fungi, which are responsible for breaking down and recycling dead plant and animal material. So uh, these fungi have enzymes that work to rot or digest the cellulose and lignin found in organic matter. So these mushrooms are very important recyclers. And if we didn't have uh, saprophytic fungi in the forest, our wood would not break down. We, wouldn't, we would just have logs upon logs upon logs, right? These, these mushrooms break things down, they recycle organic matter, turn them back into good soil. They're very important for, for this, the cycle. Um, this is a very common, um, what we call conch or polypore mushroom in Colorado, Fomatopsis pinucola, the red belt polypore. And it's called that because it has a red ring, kind of red belt around the edge. Um, the, what I was talking about at the beginning, the uh, artist conchs look similar to this. It's a different species, but they look similar to this. So when I first started looking for mushrooms, I probably found some of these. It had a white pore surface. I started etching on it. It did not do the same thing. It's a different species. Um, so you can quickly, you know, once you start learning, you can start identifying the difference between some of these mushrooms. Often saprophytic fungi look like this, like shelves, uh, but not always. Um, uh, so we have um, a lot of the great edible mushrooms that you buy in grocery stores that are cultivated are saprophytic mushrooms uh, because you can you can buy them in stores because they're rather easy to cultivate because you can just you can grow them on dead matter. You don't need a living forest. You don't need trees with roots uh, like mycorrhizal mushrooms. You just need wood chips or sawdust or other material for them to break down the things that they eat, right? Um, so uh, so agaricus um, in the grocery store. Your um, button mushrooms. Your uh, Portobellos, those are an agaricus species, agaricus bisporus, um, a really excellent edible in Colorado and many other places is the meadow mushroom, the agaricus campestris. These are some agaricus from uh, Colorado from I think last year or the year before. Um, and you can see the life cycle. So right um, in the store, a portobello is just a, a, a more mature um, agaricus. You can see here it opens up and it has a brown spores. So the spore color change, the spores change the color of the gills over time. They start off with kind of a closed like this, right? They open up with pink gills when they're young. And as the spores release, the spores kind of stick to the gills and change the color. So over time, um, the gill color uh, looks like it has changed. It's really just the spores stuck to the gills. But this is a nice picture of the life cycle of the mushroom. Um, and here's a nice specimen here of an agaricus. Another excellent edible that you can buy in the grocery store, you can grow in your house and you can find and, and um, in nature and one of the first mushrooms where people are already finding in Colorado is the oyster mushroom. These are actually a different species. Uh, this is Pleurotus ostriatus, um, uh, the oyster mushroom. These are pictures from New York. Um, in Colorado, we commonly find a Pleurotus pulmonarius growing on cottonwood. They look slightly different, but um, still an oyster mushroom. These are um, the blue oyster mushrooms. And these, these mushrooms we grew from a grow kit. I think we bought the grow kit from um, Trad and Olga Cutter's company, Mushroom Mountain in South Carolina. You can buy um, you can buy um, bags of um, substrate and grow them in your house. And these are delicious mushrooms um, to grow or to find. But they're one of the first species to come out um, in the spring. And we're already starting to see the beginnings of oyster season here in Colorado. Look on uh, dead or dying cottonwoods. Like I said, these are saprophytic mushrooms, so they're breaking down dead matter. Um, so you need you need them to be on stumps or other things that are not no longer living. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some things we don't find in Colorado that I miss a lot from the East Coast, but um, and um, 
This is the chicken mushroom or chicken of the woods, sometimes people call it. Um, and this is a, a shelf mushroom, a polypore mushroom that you can eat. It's quite delicious and it, it's called the chicken mushroom. It's bright orange, but it, it has a really amazing texture. And if you eat it, um, you can use this in as a um, substitute for chicken because it has the right texture. Um, this is a picture of me holding one that Gary Linkoff actually took in one of our forays in New York City. They're really exciting to see because they're bright orange. Oftentimes in Colorado, we're looking for like morels that look like dead leaves and you're like, or pine cones and your brain is just breaking with all the things that all the pattern recognition, you keep thinking you're seeing something. Uh, but these are like beacons in the woods. They just scream out to you and often you get a lot of them. So it's good, right? When you travel, we live in Colorado, but we travel uh, and it's really exciting to travel uh, to different places and see what mushrooms are growing there um, and in different seasons. Uh, and you'll get a variety uh, of, of mushrooms that you'll find in one place that, you, that don't grow in another place. Um, one of the other mushrooms I miss so much uh, from, from the East and the Midwest is our hen of the woods. Um, you can, maitake they're also called, you can buy these and, and cultivate it in, in uh, Whole Foods and grocery stores, uh, but the common name or the scientific name is Griffola Grif frondosa. Uh, that was a really giant version, giant species there, um, about 20 pounds. Delicious, edible, hen of the woods. Um, is has anti-cancer, antiviral, and immune system enhancing effects, and may also help control both high blood pressure and blood sugar levels. So it's one of the more healthy mushrooms to buy if you're buying grocery store mushrooms. It's one of the better uh, mushrooms to buy and eat regularly. They're also really delicious, and there's a lot of amazing recipes using Hen of the Woods. Um, on the right was a mushroom we found um, in Ohio, we were living here, we drove back to visit family um, in, in this early summer, and we found the umbrella polypore, which is a rather rare find. Um, and it looks sort of like Grifola frondosa in terms of it growing in a giant cluster in one kind of mass, but all the little mushrooms look like umbrellas, which is why it's called the uh, umbrella polypore, polyporus uh, um, embolatus, also another delicious edible mushroom probably not in Colorado. Um, enoki um, are great mushrooms. You can buy enoki in the store. This is interesting um, just to think about the difference between um, cultivated and wild mushrooms. These are the same, essentially the same mushrooms. Um, uh, enoki that grow in the wild uh, have a velvety foot and uh, kind of a sticky orange brown cap. Um, and they grow kind of big, their caps get bigger, but when you, when you cultivate them, they, because of the kind of conditions, the light conditions and the CO2 conditions, they grow very differently. So in the store, they're gonna look like this, but in the wild, they're gonna look more like this. Um, but um, enoki are really excellent in soups and salads, and enoki mushrooms have significant anti-cancer and immune enhancing effects. So another really excellent mushroom to eat uh, if you, uh, and to buy from the store. Um, these here are from Colorado. We get Flamulina uh, populacola um, in, in Colorado. Uh, in the East Coast, you mostly find Flamulina volutipes. Uh, they're really delicious mushrooms and uh, a common find in Colorado. Um, and then here we have a couple different versions of, of uh, Hericium. Uh, lion's mane. Um, lion's mane mushroom you can buy in the grocery store, and this is a really excellent mushroom to eat in terms of health benefits. Lion's mane is believed to stimulate nerve growth and may improve mild cognitive impairment. They've been doing some research uh, with uh, hericium and, um, and uh, dementia. Um, so it has some really there's a lot of potential with hericium. It's also very delicious and almost has like a fish-like quality to it. Um, on the left here, this is uh, hericium americanum, which is, tech, is the common name is called bear's head tooth, which we found in New York state. And on the right here is uh, hericium arenaceus. Um, this was actually grown from a grow kit, um, but we can find hericium in, in some of the places we foray in Colorado as well.
puffballs. You might've seen puffballs before and not realize that they're fungi. Puffballs are really fun um, to find. When they're older, they spore out like this, as you saw in this video, um, and they puff. That's why they're called puffballs. That's all of their spores poofing out. And when raindrops come and drop on it or something touches it or walks past it, um, the spores poof out. But when they're young and fresh, um, they, they're, they're white all the way through, almost like a marshmallow, and they can be eaten. Um, they're pretty good. Uh, this is a lycoperdon species of a smaller puffball. Um, but puffballs also get big and there's giant puffballs. Uh, Clavacea species are giant puffballs and these are pretty amazing to eat uh, in various uh, recipes too. So keep an eye out for puffballs. They're kind of small and they're not the best edibles, but um, they're exciting. Um, they're pretty good with butter, salt and pepper. I really like puffballs once in a while. Um, Brian was saying that someone was already finding Caprinus comatus, possibly here in Colorado, uh, the shaggy mane inky cap. Um, the shaggy mane inky cap is, uh, is a good edible when it's fresh, but they quickly start disintegrating and turning into ink. So um, what you see here is the beginning of it, of, of the Caprinus starting to turn into ink. Um, here is a bowl. If you if you collect these often, you don't you need to keep them in like ice or something um, because otherwise they quickly turn into goo. Uh, you can see they're starting to turn into goo here. But caprinus are pretty amazing because uh, you can actually use them as ink. And this is a drawing that Jessica did um, of caprinus comatus ink, uh, a, a painting of caprinus comatus with its own ink. Um, I see a couple of questions. I just want to take a quick look. I see a comment about what is the guild one? Looks like Anoki. Um, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Um, we can come back to it. Um, later. But um, anyway, Caprinus comatus, that's another edible when they're young. You can make ink out of them and paint with it when they're old. Um, it doesn't smell the best, but you know. <laughs> um, we're still in the decomposers, right? Um, auricula, uh, auricularia auricula, the wood ear is another amazing mushroom. We found some of these in Telluride uh, a couple years ago. They're going to be growing on dead logs obviously, um, but they look, you can see why they're called the wood ear. They have an ear-like quality to them. Here are some uh, larger quantity. They, and they dry up and they turn really small, but then when you rehydrate them, they come back. You find these in soups um, in Chinese restaurants sometimes. Uh, they're pretty, uh, they don't have a lot of flavor, but they have really interesting texture. These are um, a couple of medicinal mushrooms. We have reishi. Uh, on the left, we have a two different species of reishi, Ganoderma curtisii. On the left, I just think it's so beautiful with the rainbow colors. And in the top right, we have Ganoderma suge, which is a different reishi that grows on hemlock. Um, and in the bottom corner, we have Trimedes versicolor or turkey tail. Um, so these are strictly medicinal mushrooms in terms of how we would use them. Reishi um, is known to improve immuno, immuno function. It shows significant anti-inflammatory effects and can inhibit the growth of some malignant tumors. Um, some people make teas out of reishi. We like to put it in soup stock. When we save our vegetable scraps, we throw it in soup stock. It's pretty bitter tasting, but um, it has some medicinal qualities to it. Um, turkey tail. Um, has proven anti-cancer effects. The FDA approved uh, this mushroom for um, breast cancer treatment. Uh, there's a great um, video, Paul Stamets talks about, I think six ways mushrooms can save the world. And he talks about how his mother's stage four breast cancer um, was cured and he was putting her on a regimen of um, turkey tail. And so it's a really fascinating study. There's a lot of research out there on turkey tail and breast cancer. Um, it also is kind of bitter. So it's another mushroom you might wanna throw into something else. It doesn't taste the best, but you can also buy um, 
you know, in health food stores, Stamets has a company, um, uh, Myco, um, I can't remember the name right now, but you can find the, 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 the pills or tinctures um, in, in health food stores, and they definitely sell turkey tail, reishi, and combinations. This is a really fun one. When um, a couple of years ago, it was pretty dry. We didn't find many edibles, but um, you get a, a magnifying loop and you start looking at everything you can find. And once in a while, you'll come across a really fun find like bird's nest fungi. And you can see why they might be called bird's nest. This was taken through a magnifying loop at like 10 times. They're really small. They start off with a, like, a, like a little um, cover uh, and then that opens up, pops open and it it shows, it, it, it reveals the spore sacs. And so it's called bird's nest because it looks like a little nest with, uh, with eggs in there. These are all individual spore sacs uh, and the rain drops in here, spores poof out of all these spore sacs. Um, but bird's nest, it's really tiny, really, really small, but it's known to be um, an immuno enhancer. And there's actually promising new research being done into the possible treatment of pancreatic cancer with, um, with certain things that are found in um, bird's nest uh, fungi. And that's really amazing because there's not much, I don't think there's any, we don't know of anything that can, can uh, help with pancreatic cancer at the moment. So there's exciting new research on um, bird's nest fungi. And then finally, maybe the, the moment you've all been waiting for morels. We get excited around this time of year for morels um, because they come, they start happening in the spring and they have a pretty short season and everyone gets morel fever, freaking out. Uh, you know, people get angry over their, people, people get angry if you steal their morel spot or if you're, if you find their morel spot. Um, but they're also pretty difficult to find. They often look like dead leaves, like I said, or the black morels look like pine cones. Uh, morels are interesting because they have the unique ability to be both mycorrhizal and saprobic based on the available habitat. They can uh, create an association with a tree and be mycorrhizal, or they can break down dead material and be saprophytic, uh, depending on the conditions. These are uh, Marcella esculentoides, which is the blonde morel. These are the first to appear in the lower riparian uh, wetland, wet areas around rivers and things um, in, the, in the spring. Um, and this is a Mar Marcella species, uh, kind of a snowbank morel that we found last year. Um, and these will be growing kind of er also earlier in the season up the mountain a little bit on where snow melt is happening. Um, they often grow in association with these red cup fungi. This is the or orange cup fungi. And this is the same mushroom, same fungi, but you can see that over time it bruises or stains a really beautiful uh, blue color. Uh, but often you'll see certain mushrooms in association with other mushrooms in the same habitat at the same time. And then, um, there are burn morels. Um, this is a species of black burn morel. And um, in Colorado, we have fires every year. And you, um, if you pay attention to where fires have happened, um, morels, this uh, burn morels are the, one of the first things to come back after uh, a forest fire. So, um, and then they grow within the first three years of the fire. So the first year, they're the most prevalent, they pop up. And in this case, it was crazy. It was everywhere. Brian was there. It was nuts. Um, we couldn't step without finding morels. Then the next year, they're still there a little bit. They're still going to be there. The third year, they're there almost. They're still there, but they're starting to disappear. And then after that, they kind of disappear. And, and we think that these mushrooms are really important to the, the health of the soil, bringing the forest back after the um, after the forest fire, creating a, a space for other um, plants and other life to take hold, and then they've kind of done their job. But the mycelium is still underground, and then if a forest fire happens again, they will pop. So pay attention to not just rain patterns, but where fires have happened in the past few years. If it's the right elevation and the right kind of habitat, uh, you might find um, a honey hole, as we say, of uh, burn morels. So the third uh, uh, kind of uh, 
type of fungi are parasitic fungi, and parasitic fungi attack and eventually kill a living host. So rather than obtaining their food from, from dead material, dead plants or dead animals, they prefer the living host, often attacking and killing it. And then off, some of them can live on as saprophytes, uh, breaking down the dead matter. Um, I have two pictures here I did not take, but on the right um, are honey mushrooms, Armillaria miaea, Milea, I found these in, 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 in uh, New York before. They are edibles, maybe not the best edible, um, but something to note about honey mushrooms, um, the largest living organism on the planet is actually, well, a mushroom. It's really a colony of mycelium of honey mushrooms, an armillaria species uh, in the Mollar National Forest in Oregon, which stretches three and a half miles across and extends an average of three feet down into the ground. It covers 2,200 acres, which is as big as like 1,600 football fields, and is estimated to be 2,400 years old. And they, they are parasitic. They are killing all the trees and everything around it. So from, from above, you can see this giant area where it's killed all of the trees. Um, so that's the largest living organism. Um, on the left is pretty exciting. These are cordyceps. And as you can see, that is an insect with a, um, a fruiting body of a cordyceps coming out of its brain, basically. Um, cordyceps are parasitic on living insects. Um, cordyceps are able, the spores get into the insect and it's able to take over the function of the insect. And there's some debate about how that actually happens, but it kind of zombifies the insect for, for lack of a better term. And it controls the insect and the insect goes usually up somewhere higher off the ground, sometimes to the canopy of the forest. It latches on its pinchers or its legs into a leaf or the bottom of a leaf or a, or a branch, and then it dies. Then the mushroom comes out of its brain, fruits, and it releases its spores up high so it has a long distance that it can travel and spread its spores. Really crazy. Uh, you can see some amazing photos of cordyceps in different, um, uh, from within different insects on the internet if you do a quick Google, Google search for cordyceps. But cordyceps uh, also are really have a use for a human use. Um, they're known to improve respiratory health and increase oxygen uptake among other properties. And it has been recommended to us when we first moved here, probably by Jennifer, um, to take cordyceps to help with elevation sickness. Um, it helps oxygenate your blood. Um, you can you get better, you know, um, you can have more stamina at the higher altitudes and anyone who gets like headaches when they come down the mountain, it really does help to take some cordyceps in the morning with your coffee or something uh, with, to deal with your elevation sickness. And cordyceps can be grown also. If you find a cordyceps like this, you can, um, uh, you can actually create, um, you can grow from there. You don't need insects to parasitize. Okay, other parasites, um, this is chaga. The common name is chaga. Um, chaga is actually kind of a, actually technically a canker. Um, this does not grow here. A lot of people always ask about chaga. It doesn't really grow here because it grows on birch trees and we don't have birch trees uh, in Colorado. Uh, but chaga has long been used as a folk remedy for cancer, tuberculosis, diabetes, uh, and digestive diseases in Russia and elsewhere in Northern Europe where there are a lot of birch trees. Um, Recent research has shown that the compounds in chaga can kill cancer cells and stimulate immune system. Um, and a lot of people drink chaga, uh, but we need some more clinical trials to confirm these findings because there are there have been some recent articles in Fungi Magazine and other places that talk about the dangers of taking chaga too much. There can be some negative effects as well. Uh, they're still trying to figure this out. Chaga is pretty amazing though. It grows out of out of a tree in like a horn shape, um, often a horn shape. And then the out, outer texture looks kind of like burnt charcoal to me, but when you open it up, it's bright orange. Um, and you can dry these off, uh, dry these pieces um, in chunks. Uh, these are drying in the sun. And then, um, and then you can, uh, oops. Uh, you can put those, you can boil those in a tea or grind them up into a powder. Uh, you can see, um, 
you can find chaga in some mushroom uh, health stores. There is an overharvesting problem happening with chaga, kind of popular, and then a lot of people are overharvesting chaga. And you can see at the beginning of uh, this first slide, if you pull this entire chaga off of a tree, it actually will kill the tree. It opens up a giant wound for other things to take over and the tree will die quickly. If you only harvest a little bit of the chaga, the chaga will continue to grow and it's, it's killing the tree slowly. So you don't wanna over harvest chaga because you're gonna kill the source. It might last there for several years and you can continue harvesting. So it's important to be Pay attention to that if you are in a place where chaga is growing. Um, this, uh, this is Fomis fomentarius, another really interesting um, um, parasitic mushroom. Uh, this is also known as the tinder conch. Um, this is one of the ones that first, at first it's parasitic and then it lives on as a saprobe on hardwoods, especially birches and beech trees. And it's traditionally used as the main ingredient of amadou. So it's called a tinder conch or, or sometimes a, a horse hoof or something like that because it kind of looks like a hoof. But here we have, um, the, if you cut it open, you can see the tubes where it drops its spores, but there's a layer between the hard outer shell and the tube layer right here that's, that's a very kind of like, almost like a uh, felt-like material. And this has been the traditional ingredient of amadou a material that's primarily used as tinder for fire starting, but you can also make clothing and other items. So there are these really cool hats that the, uh, you can buy that are made in made out of amadou or um, fly fishing um, wicking material. You can buy that. It's called amadou. It's often made out of this this material. It's a naturally uh, very good material for wicking, drawing moisture out of out of um, something. And then this is a birch polypore. So a birch polypore is saprobic and possibly parasitic on, on deadwood of birch and occasionally on living birch trees. Um, this one's really interesting. And I bring up both of these polypores, uh, tinder conchs and the birch polypore because um, this guy, this handsome fellow named Utsi, you may have heard of the, the 5,000 year old ice man that they found in the, um, in, in the, in the Alps, uh, in the, in the like melting glaciers um, uh, several years, you know, a while, not too long ago. Um, he, was, he was from 5,000 years ago. He was pretty well preserved because he was in the ice. Um, and he was carrying four pieces of tinder conch, Fomis fomentarius, which they concluded would, uh, was, was used for tinder um, on a belt. Uh, the way that they used to use, they think they used to use uh, um, the tinder conch actually is if you bored a hole in the bottom here uh, up into down into into the um, um, amadou layer you could drop a ember from a fire and it could smolder all day in your tinder uh, in your tinder conch and you could carry transport uh, your fire with you and not have to start all over the next place you went so they think let's see 5,000 years ago was using fomius fomentarius as tinder um, he also carried a birch polypore, and they speculate that that fungus may have been used as a laxative to expel whipworm. And it also is known to have antibiotic and septic properties. So it's kind of like a caveman band-aid. So um, these mushrooms have had long use in culture and human culture, um, and Otsi is, is proof of that. And finally, a very good edible that is a parasite. Uh, we call it the lobster mushroom. It's actually Hypomyces uh, lactiflorum, and Hypomyces is a uh, is a, a fungus that parasitizes another fungus. So these are lobster mushrooms that we found Jen Je Jessica and Jennifer and I found a couple years ago. We often have a good lobster mushroom season. These are you know in the right season. These are pretty expensive in the stores um, because they're foraged and they're pretty delicious, um, but um, what, a, what, what lobster mushroom actually is, is it's a hypomyces uh, fungus that parasitizes either a rustula or a, or a lactiflus uh, mushroom and turns it from that mushroom into a, into a different thing. It, um, it's sterile after that, it doesn't drop spores, it, it, it gil the gills get covered over, it's really hard um, and it, basically turns these two other mushrooms that are not really edibles into something that we consider a choice edible mushroom. And it's one uh, small, 
tiny little fungus that it doesn't really have fruiting bodies that takes over another fungus before it fruits and converts it into something that we do eat. Okay, so um, people are still with us here. I just wanted to end with um, talking about briefly uh, some poisonous mushrooms and lookalikes just as a warning. Remember, you know, there are delicious edible mushrooms out there. There are medicinal mushrooms out there. There are exciting mushrooms to find out there. There's also deadly poisonous mushrooms out there. So we have to be paying attention, um, being really careful with what we're doing. Uh, the, the forager rule is when in doubt, throw it out, right? Um, and so I just wanna go through a couple examples of lookalikes. Some of these don't, aren't in Colorado, uh, but for instance, um, we have the morel on the right and the false morel on the left. Gyrometra, Gyrometra esculenta is the false morel. I think these look different. Uh, however, if someone told you uh, there's, morel, there's morels growing in the woods right now and they're brown uh, and uh, they're growing in these habitats and, they're, and they kind of shape like this, you might, if you've never seen a real morel before, you might mistake it. Um, but uh, Gyrometra esculenta are known to be deadly poisonous. Um, they have gyromitra, gyromitrin in them, and gyromitrin is a, 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 a something they use to make rocket fuel. Um, in, in a lot of places, they tell you not to even touch them with your bare hands um, because you can get sick from, from um, false morels. But we right here, uh, this is our friend Rita in the, in the bright colors. And Rita is from Finland. And Finland is one of the couple places on the planet that eat these as a delicacy. Uh, a lot of places it's illegal to sell these in the market, but in Finland, they eat them. Uh, and so we were in upstate New York, pretty about two hours away from the nearest hospital. We thought about, you know, I remember Gary Linkoff telling me that if I ever found these and decided to eat them, I should leave a, a note next to my body <laughs> before I eat them, uh, apologizing to my parents for taking an unnecessary risk. Um, Rita was convincing us these are the choicest of choicest mushrooms and there's a beautiful, excellent, delicious delicacy uh, recipe that she makes all the time with her parents in Finland called Korva Sieni Pitaraka, the ear mushroom pie and that we have to eat them. So we were kind of like thinking about it, doing all this research. Um, we found the Finnish, uh, essentially the, the FDA of Finland uh, has a uh, cooking guide on how to prepare these properly. And when you buy them in the markets, they have a guide that comes with it, tells you how to cook them properly. And the way they do it in Finland um, is that you have to boil uh, water, throw the mushrooms in for like a five to 10 minutes in an open air kitchen. You don't wanna inhale these fumes. The window needs to be open uh, because the fumes, the off-gassing of the gyrometrin can get you sick. Um, and then uh, pour that water out, do that all over again. Fresh water, bring to a boil. Boil for five minutes in a rolling boil. Let the fumes get off gas, then cook them. And then we made this uh, Corva Sieni Piraca with uh, chives and the uh, false morels. And um, man, it was delicious, but we only ate a little piece and waited six hours to see if any of us were starting to get sick because we had a long drive to the hospital ahead of us. It's an unnecessary risk. Um, and there's also, we don't know, uh, one, if the, if the gyromitra esculenta that we taught, that, that are called the same mushroom that is growing in Finland, that we call gyromitra esculenta, is, is the same as gyromitra esculenta that grows in Colorado, for instance. We don't know, we're starting to do more DNA sequencing in the mushroom world that's telling us a lot more of, uh, about uh, mushrooms that we used to think were the same are actually very different at uh, the DNA level. We don't know if they're the same. We also don't know, um, and it's common knowledge in like Eastern Europe and in Finland where they eat these mushrooms, you're only supposed to eat them once in a while. Um, they're a delicacy, you don't, you don't eat too much of them. And it's because actually, um, if you eat these, these, these toxins can build up in your system. And if you eat too much of them, um, you can actually get sick or die. So I've done that once, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, I love to tell the tale and it was a delicious meal, but it's a big risk and not, not something we, we condone. Um, 
these, I don't think we have jack-o'-lantern mushrooms in Colorado, but if you're going out to the West Coast, to California, if you're traveling back East, you wanna know about jack-o'-lantern mushrooms. Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms are pretty amazing. Um, they, are, uh, they glow in the dark. Um, so if uh, at night, if you're, if you're in the woods, um, you might see glowing green or blue. I think it's greenish. Uh, I've never actually seen it glow, but jack o' lanterns are, no, are, are, are known to glow in the dark. Um, some mushrooms do that. They think it's for attracting insects, um, but it's called bioluminescence. Uh, so uh, these are jack o' lanterns. Um, they are bright orange. They generally go pretty big. They grow in clusters. They have true gills, right? But in a lot of guidebooks, uh, um, they recommend that this is the lookalike, the poisonous lookalike of the chanterelle. Um, if you start knowing what you're doing, you'll know that they're not chanterelles when you see them. These are true gills. These are not true gills. These are ridges, but they're both orange. Uh, these are much brighter orange. These are more yellow orange. But as you can see, it's important to start understanding the differences, start really paying attention to all the features because there are lookalikes of different mushrooms. So the jack-o'-lantern here, um, and the chanterelle here. Um, these are uh, deadly gallerinas. Um, Gallerina marginata, one of the deadlier mushrooms, one of the most deadly mushrooms out there. Um, deadly gallerinas are brown mushrooms with gills. That's a tough category to kind of figure out. People who are looking for psilocybe species often might find gallerina species. You can see already. I don't know, here's just some enoki mushrooms again. But you can see that, okay, if, you, if you're not really paying attention, maybe you mistake these for these. They're identifying features you wanna really pay attention to. That's why you go with a club or have a guidebook um, and you really pay attention to all those, all those attributes. You do spore prints. The spore prints of flamulina and the spore print of gallerina are gonna be very different, for instance. So um, these are deadly, deadly poisonous, one of the top deadly poisonous mushrooms out there. And then um, Amanita, Amanita species. Um, this is Amanita muscaria, the classic Mario mushroom, the fly agaric. This has been, has a lot of folk uh, traditions behind this mushroom um, and shamanistic uses, but it's also poisonous if you don't do it properly and actually kind of poisonous if you do. So um, uh, Amin Am Amanita genus has some of the most deadly poisonous mushrooms uh, out there. So we wanna be careful to um, not mistake something like the death cap, very deadly mushroom, with something like a horse mushroom or the agaricus that we were talking about, an agaricus species like we were talking about earlier, right? You can see there are some identifying features right away with an ammonita, usually have a vulva like this, usually have a veil like this. They have white gills. We talked earlier about agaricus having pink gills and then later turning brown. Ammonitas have white gills. These are things you start figuring out, but you can see if you're not really knowing what you're doing or not paying too close of attention, these can maybe look pretty similar. This is deadly poisonous. This is a delicious edible. Also, um, sometimes people mistake ammonita eggs, as you call them, uh, with puffballs. So it's important when you have a, when you think you found a puffball to cut it open. It should look just like a marshmallow. Um, but if you find uh, an ammonita in its egg state before it opens up and out of the vulva, you will see the evidence of a mushroom in there with gills. So it's important to really pay attention to what you're doing. And then the mushrooms that probably get most, we most, uh, Brian uh, is the one of the contacts for poison control in Colorado in this area. And one of the most common mushrooms people get sick from is the false parasol mushroom. Uh, also called the uh, the green spored lepiota or the vomiter. Um, this is the uh, this is the it has green spores. It's greenish. It smells really like chlorophor. It's, it's really like toxic smelling to me, plasticky or something. Um, on the right here is the parasol mushroom, which is an edible. Um, this looks very different in the end, uh, but they both kind of grow big, look like parasols. So again, pay attention. Join a club learn what you're doing, and when in doubt, throw it out. Um, speaking of lookalikes, uh, I just want to recommend everybody go to the Telluride Mushroom Festival uh, when you can. It's in August of every year. Uh, there's an amazing costume contest, which I didn't know about when I made this Halloween costume a few years ago when I was in New York City. 
but this is a, uh, uh, on the left there, I found an Ammonida bisporigera or the destroying angel, another one of the deadly poisonous mushrooms. And from Halloween, I dressed up as an Ammonida uh, bisporigera, the destroying angel. But for the past few years, as Jennifer mentioned, Jessica and I have uh, made costumes that have won prizes at the Telluride Mushroom Festival costume contest. It's the, the end of the festival. It's a really fun time. Uh, everyone dresses up like mushrooms. Uh, two years ago, we went as different stink horns. Uh, on the left here, Jesse was dressed as the veiled lady stink horn. And on the right, I was dressed as the dog stink horn. You can probably figure out why it's called the dog stink horn. This is a really beautiful mushroom. It drops this veil, this skirt down that, that some people think might be like a ladder to allow uh, insects to climb up. Um, stink horns are really interesting. You'll find them. They smell really gross and the spores are like a brown sticky substance on the cap. Flies get attracted to them because they kind of smell like rotting flesh and then the spores get stuck to the flies and the flies fly away and disperse the spores that way. And then last year we dressed up as some, uh, not, the, not the most, uh, you know, famous of mushrooms, uh, Xylaria polymorpha. These were dead man's fingers. Uh, you can find these um, growing out of, out of, you know, out of the ground, often in clusters that look like hands. I've seen them a lot in cemeteries, um, but they're a Xylaria polymorpha species. Um, and we dressed up last year as Xylaria polymorpha, dead man's fingers. So, um, that is the end of my talk. Thank you guys for hanging on. Um, I just wanted to mention again, we are, if you're not a member, we are Pikes Peak Mycological Society located in Colorado Springs and the area. We go all around the south, southern part of Colorado looking for mushrooms. Um, our website is pikespeakmyc.org. That's pikespeakmyc.org. And a lot of the things that we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, you can find how to join the club. You can find the resources, the library, all the different books that we recommend, um, some of our news items. You can also join our Facebook group. Uh, it's another great way. Um, all of our meetings are open to the public. And then um, uh, if you're a member, you get access to the forays that we go on and, and, and some of other things. But like I said, we're still figuring out our season. We're gonna figure, we'll let you know how the next meeting is gonna go in May and there on, from there on uh, for the summer. We usually meet through September and then have a final uh, kind of potluck or, or food oriented meeting in October at the end of the season. So thank you guys for watching. I'm looking on uh, YouTube right now to see if there are any questions. Well, Brian's still here. Brian, um, I'm going to unmute you. Hold on. I'm going to close my, stop my share. I'm going to unmute Brian and bring him back. Brian, is there anything you'd like to add to anything that I said or corrections you want to make? <laughs> oh, that was very excellent, very informative, and uh, lovely lecture. Thank you, Ben. That was Wow, what a nice lecture. And uh, uh, it's going to be a great year uh, coming up in early May if we get out um, and do our own social distancing. I have uh, Parisium coralloides that I've put together in spawn jars. And we will go to various places in the woods. And I have a drill, a hand drill that's not about it's human powered and we will uh, plug a few fallen logs and come back in August and see if we get mushrooms. Other than that, thank you for a lovely lecture. That was fantastic. Great information. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. And then um, great. Yeah. So uh, you can contact us at info at pikespeakmike.org with any questions, ask questions on the Facebook group. Um, and we look forward to trying to do some forays in the coming months. We're just going to pay attention to uh, what's going on with COVID-19 and make sure we're being safe first. Um, but we'll keep you posted. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, this will live on YouTube after this. Uh, so you can watch it later or share it with people that weren't able to be here. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for the board and the officers for being here and introducing yourselves. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye now.